<laughs> These transitions crack me up. I feel like I'm back in radio in college. Uh, hey, everybody. It's Keith Williams. This is 5 Watt Live today. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, Jeff and I are always looking for reasons to go down the rabbit hole on guitar tone. And some folks that had bought the Stomp preset packs from me over the years asked if, um, while we did these videos on the series that I call Guitars of the Guitar Heroes, um, they asked if we were going to do preset packs for these. And it's a great excuse to go digging into the minutia of the rigs that people used over the years. Um, and it's a lot of fun actually, you know, to go digging for individual information about kind of what is the best model in the Helix universe for certain things. So for example, if you had the pack, you're gonna notice that um, there's like a park amp instead of a JTM 45. And I'll talk about why that is. Um, so my original preset pack that I did way back when probably should be, I should rename it to Keith's Heroes because it's like Robin Ford, Eric Johnson, a ton of David Grissom things from his first record. Love that record. It's just amazing guitar tone. Just a huge fan. If, you've, if you haven't seen the interview that I got to do with David Grissom, Jeff set that up and I'm total fanboy through the whole thing. Although it, there's, I'm, I should make a short out of it. There's this great moment where I, I basically say, you know, the most important thing is the amp and David goes, no, you're completely wrong. It's the guitar. <laughs> so anyway, that was great. So go look at that one if you haven't seen that. Uh, so we're going to talk about Clapton's gear that he used on some of the big hits. We did 16 different tunes in the preset pack, but we're only going to probably do four or five here. And then actually, um, uh, but before I bring Jeff in, he's already got the appropriate guitars in hand. Uh, I want to thank BV Ninja for being here, as always, to moderate for us today. He keeps us all honest, and yet at the same time, we have yet to stump him with a question. I haven't stumped them. You guys have yet to stump him. So we all got to keep trying. And uh, so thanks a lot to BV for being here. BV's put the link to the preset pack and probably everything else we sell. He'll be throwing that up in the uh, in the chat for you guys to see. Uh, so let me get Jeff in here. Uh, bring him on screen. Add to there. there he is. Hello. <laughs> he said he was really nervous today because he never does this. I never do this. <laughs> I'm terrified. Jeff is the king of live streams. That's absolutely. Yeah. So uh and we'll get Jeff to talk about maybe um briefly talk about it. did you did you talk about your Murphy Lab 335 on your stream yesterday? Uh, uh for a minute. Yeah, yeah, a little a minute? bit. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll see. Well, we'll see a few how, minutes, how but people nerded that. out everybody wants to get. That's tough. Um Jeff's obviously holding his uh historic makeover um uh custom shop. Burst. Burst. Yeah burstage um so he's got that 335 we'll use that uh i'm gonna and because he's got that um he could maybe model it i actually even brought my few gibsons out i only got to get two gibsons now that's it they're, they're in the back there and if we have time and people have to talk about it i, I actually I, I bought another guitar recently anyway so oh, uh, man you gotta stop doing that <laughs> I, I do. I'm joking. I, you know, it's really off brand. I'm not, I'm not having a great summer. Yeah. So I wanted to tell the two stories because somebody called me out about it. I, I love it. I, I love the community and I love it when people call me out uh, on this. Um, uh, 
that um, there's two different stories that have that are regularly told about Clapton's red cherry red 64 335. And the one I told in the recent Clapton video is the one that Clapton tells most often, especially he tells it around the time that he was going to auction it off. And he says that he bought that guitar in 1964 at the end of the Yardbirds. There is actually one photograph of him playing a 335 block neck, you know, which is clearly not a burst 335 because one of the other guys in the band had a 335, um, which is actually an earlier guitar. And it's a burst. There, there we go. There we go. It's just doing the appropriate. Um, and that's what I reported in Clapton history, the guitar history video. But in the, if you go back to the 335 video, I tell the other story. And, and you know, I'm I'm always cutting these things. It's really tight. So the I don't have room to say. There's two stories and tell them both, but I'm doing it here. So the other story is um, uh, Jerry Donahue, who you guys might know from the Hellcasters uh, with John Jorgensen and Will Ray, um, is. Um, I don't know how old how old Jerry is, but he was old enough that he was gone. He is so crazy about British blues at the time. He'd moved to London and he worked at Selmer's. And so he was in Selmer's the day of the last cream show at Royal Albert Hall. And Jerry tells the story that Clapton came in and pointed at the Cherry Red 335 behind the counter. And Jerry reached up and pulled it down and handed it to him. And he tells that story all the time. And, and I reported that story because it was in a couple of 335 books, probably Tony Bacon's book, which is a, you know, Tony's Brit. And so that's the story that's very widely told there. So there's these two very disparate stories. Um, as I said, you know, the, I think memories of that time are, how shall we say, um, diluted, diluted, diluted. That's good, politically <laughs> correct. Huh? Chemically yeah. altered. Yeah, anyway. Hey, and it was a long time ago. I, I was... You know, 1964, I was four years old. So Jeff, Jeff wasn't even born, right? No. 64? No, no. Jeffy's a kid. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, <laughs> Jeffy, we'll call him. Yeah, thanks. Say. Yeah, there we go. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, the presets are in the link. Uh, we're also, as a celebration, we're, we're giving away the preset that you heard Jeff playing on White Room, which, of course, is a very thinly veiled promotional ploy on our part. Um, to have you check it out. Um, actually, we really liked the way the presets came out. And what happened was Jeff and I were bouncing them back and forth. And, uh, and you know, we're, we're good enough friends that it's like, oh, yeah, you got that completely wrong, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. And yeah, no, it doesn't talk like at all. <laughs> what, and then actually- What version had... of the song were you listening to? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right, which record, which record yeah. were you listening to? So we, um, uh, the funny part was there was a, a moment early in the back and forth where Jeff sent me one that was like one of the early cream ones, a Marshall-y tone. And I, I have it here at the desk. You know, this is my workspace. This is where I type the scripts. And this is, I've got a, I got a pod go up here now because that's the presets we're working on. And, and I had my stomp up here on the deck. On the deck. And I, uh, I was, I was, I started laughing because I realized that I was, I wasn't just working. I wasn't just testing. I was all of a sudden, I was really inspired and I was just playing like through my monitors. I was like, okay, this is, this is the level that need, these all need to be. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'd, I'd like to try to do um, uh, a few tunes and I'm gonna tell you which ones that we thought we would talk about. And then we're gonna uh, all be entertained by uh, Jeff's periodic attempts to not get copyright strikes while at the same time right. <laughs> invoking the, the ghost the of some style of, the of In the style yeah. of. We, we were laughing earlier because I, you know, he was playing, uh, you were playing uh, the solo on Layla or something. Yeah. Yeah, right. And he's like, oh, I'll play a student version. And he's playing it sort of badly. I'm like, I'm sure Clapton had nights where it wasn't quite that in tune. So <laughs> he had some rough years there. So um, not to not to knock on anybody's heroes. Clapton's certainly one of my heroes. So the tunes I thought we would try to talk about are Badge. Uh, it's definitely a 335 moment. Um, All Your Love. Um, uh, Layla, which is really interesting. And Forever Man, kind of like four tunes from different eras. What I'd like you guys to do is if there's tunes that you want to talk about in particular, put questions in the in the chat, but make sure you preface them with at 5 Watt World so that they really pop out and we can pull them back or that uh, need, uh, BB can see them and then you know feed them back to me as we, as we get to them, um, if that works for everybody. Is that cool? All right. This is the part where everybody goes, oh, your sound's not on. No. It's, that's my typical stream. I've had, I've had, what do they say? The Brits say touch wood. I've, I've had a really good run here. So mm -hmm. overdue. 
Um, so yeah, so um, I already did my confessional moment. I'll only talk about the Gibson I just bought if people really have to do that. We'll do it at the end. How's that? We'll do it at the end. So let's do, Jeff's got a Les Paul in his lap. So let's do um, All Your Love. Right. Yes, that's it. There it is. Nice, nice. So I I got with the pack. I we uh, I wrote a I spent a day actually writing release notes where I talk about the choices we made in all of these things. So in the modeling world, this is a great place to start actually because Jeff and I know Jeff Jeff in particular has been around the industry a long time. Uh, we were laughing about this before we got started, and it's just you you just inevitably you meet people across it. And Jeff and I both know people at Line Six to the extent that. You know, these guys can just walk down the hall and know what amps got modeled for the JTM 45. They know what amp got modeled for the, you know, and so we reached out and and we told, you know, these guys what we're doing. They were really excited, of course, that we were doing uh, some line six stuff. And um, and the, they're like, OK, well, you didn't hear this from me, but the best marshal is actually a park, park 75. And uh, I don't know the specific years of park. Um, but Park was a company that Jim Marshall founded, and they're they're not hot rotted. They're very much Marshalls. But as people know, uh, all those early Marshalls sound a little. Everyone sounds different, and frankly, especially the JTMs, because um, they were so sought after and they were used by all these heroes. Almost all of them, once they got bought by somebody else, and then it became the Van Halen time, they all got breathed on, as as the euphemism goes. They all got modded. Uh, so like breathed that. on. You ever heard that? Yeah, no, I never heard that. You never heard that? Oh, no, that, never heard that. that's an old amp thing that uh, I learned from Dan Lurie. He's like, well, mm -hmm. it's not original. It's looks like it's been breathed on a little bit. I like that. So, that's great. <laughs> so, so the Park 75 of the room of amps that were modeled in the Marshall kind of universe that are that have found their way into the Helix and then the Stomp and and in, in the Pod Go um, is this? Uh, it's, it's just a the Brit P75 Bright BRT. And that's a Park 75 amp that Line 6 model. It's essentially a Plexi um, uh, from the side company Park. Uh, it, it sounds to us the most like the 100 watt Marshalls that Clapton was using at that cream kind of fit. And which which recording, Jeff really was the cream expert on, well, actually the expert on all this, but um, which recording were we using? The studio or a live recording? For well, th this, this one is all your love. Right. This this would be the the JTM forty five sort right. of thing, and um, I'm I'm kind of forgetting. Let me take a look. Did I use the? I'm being a little bit of a moron right. Did now. you do it? Uh, yeah, this is the Park seventy five. Yep. Um, the reason why, like we talked about just just now in the digital world, and this has always been the case, like whether it's it's anything, whether it's the Ox or the Axe FX mm -hmm. or something, it it doesn't matter to me what it says. Right. Sometimes like oh this is the cabinet it's supposed to be, but this actually this cabinet over here sounds more like it. Right. Um, and so to me, an early Marshall is always going to have a certain sort of thing to it. Um, and so the Park 75, I actually, when I was at Line 6 many years ago, played that amp in person. Oh, that's cool. Because I go, you got to hear this amp, you know. And, know and, that. Yeah, we heard it. And I was like, this is really great. Now my ears are shot. You know, but um, so you and I went back and forth. The JTM 45 that they have, which would be the, the amp that would have been used, Sounded really, really good, but there was just something about the feel of this Park 75, like yeah. the, the envelope of the note, which is really important stuff about those early recordings to me on the Clapton, so well, any Clapton, but those Cream records and the um, the the uh, the Blues Breaker, Blues Breakers record, uh, there's an envelope to the notes. It almost like it squares off at the top. Does that make sense? Like in JTM 45s, kind of, if you look at distortion waves, like. JTM 40, like a fuzz square. It's like a square wave almost. Somebody's probably correcting me if I'm wrong. But the JTM 45 seem to kind of like cap off in a weird way, in a good way, that makes them sound like a JTM 45 as opposed to like a Plexi. This one kind of did it more than the other one. So I just thought that w I agree that this was uh, and, going and back on, and forth. And on other tunes, we, you ended up do, you ended up using the JTM 45. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some of the other and, and, presets, because as you say, um, for this, it's more like it and the feel is more like it, but there were others where, it was, and we actually, uh, on this one, we ended up using what they call their four by 12 greenback cab with 25s, um, but they also have a greenback cab with 20s and they have a blackback cab. And um, mm -hmm. there's, there's patches where we're mixing the greenback and the blackback cab. There's places where we're using the blackback cab. And again, Jeff's like, yeah, I don't care what the names are. This sounds more like the record or, or then we'll also change up microphones. And I, I, in most of these cases, I tell you what microphones we chose for the same reason. Yeah. And, uh, and then of course, you know, what, what plate reverb and those kinds of things too. And, yeah. and the thing about the two microphones, which is interesting because most I'm not, of course, I, don't, I wasn't there in 1965 <laughs> when they did the record, you know. Yep. Um, but nowadays, most amps are mic'd with two different ampli two microphones. Right. So usually one gets more the lower end than the body of the amp. The other one usually gets the higher end. So like if you do classic, like a 57 is a bit more of a mid-rangey bright thing. So like perfect example for me of like a Marshall, like a modern, <laughs> relatively modern Marshall that with a 57 is like British Steel by Judas Priest. Like if you listen to that record, mm. classic, like, jcm 800 or early you know jmp late jmp with a 57 like it right. just sounds like that to me right. you know so um w when you mix them you get a lot more body to the, the sound so if you go through some of these patches and you if you say if you want to turn off one of the cabinets you'll hear oh that one's higher than brighter than that one and that one's got more body to it so you put the two together and that's what you usually do in the studio it's usually not just one microphone in, in present day that is but back in yes. the day Right now in present day, yeah. Right, and back in the day they didn't do that. So we were looking for mics that would sort of split the difference and get close to the tone that we were hearing specifically on that, on that patch. And again, it's almost a way, in the Helix world, it's a way to sort of EQ what you're getting coming off the cabinet. It's the final stage of EQing that patch mm -hmm. as it's coming off the cabinet. And we use different mics for a lot of the different patches. Yeah. There, there are a bunch of sort of Sennheiser 421 and... Um, uh, sure 57s on a bunch of them. Um, which is one thing I lean towards in the real world anyway. Right. Absolutely. Classic, right? Yeah. That's pretty classic. That's, that's what modern, I had. modern 1970s. Not, <laughs> you know? right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, if you go all the way back to like may all and the blues breakers that Decca studio, um, they probably had a room full of condensers. I mean, a mic right. closet full of condensers, you know, you, you 47s and 67s and 87s. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember reading, um, an interview with Alan Parsons who worked at Abbey Road, right? When as an engineer, was a really young man. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, yeah, we had these three kinds of mics and everything else was placement. Yep. Yeah, it's fascinating. And Art you know, this whole thing about on that, um, on the Mayall record that, you know, Clapton took the microphone all the way across the room. Mm -hmm. uh, by most accounts, it was maybe three feet away right. uh, from the amp, you know? So it was getting room, especially a condenser, yeah. but at the same time, you know, one, one type of, uh, which, which we kind of put a little bit of delay on. We put a bit of a slap back to emulate did. the room sound Yep. because sometimes, you know, in the digital world, when you move the microphone away, it it's, you know, it's not ever really going to be, unless you're talking about maybe thousand dollars plugins right. that do these things. So you can emulate some of that room sound so you can kind of hear it. Oh, you can hear it. Yeah. yeah so it's a super quick, uh, slap back, but so it sounds like a reverb in a way. Yeah, it's in not. a nice room. Yeah, it's a nice room sound. And yep. um, that really livens it up quite a bit. When you listen to those original recordings, it's in a room. Like, you can hear the room, which is a – I think it was you and I were talking about this. That like, when you recorded at stacks, part of the reason why it sounded, those records, records sounded the way they did, is the players, but it, you're hearing the room. Yeah, And that's absolutely. one thing about the Decca Studio thing. You can hear that room. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that we used on this one was, and Jeff really fell in love with this particular plate because it is what it's named. Um, in the recent update, they added a, a plate reverb called Dynamic Plate. And in, in addition to the reverb, um, there's there's like this little cloud thing that happens. Um, and that's pretty authentic. And it's a DSP hog. Um, mm -hmm. So we only could use it, you know, in some places. But here, this is a pretty straightforward patch. So it, it's, it actually is on this All Your Love patch. Yeah. So great. And, and just one thing when we're designing the patches, one thing that was most important to me was, as you mentioned earlier, am I having fun playing the patch? Right. Uh, and, you know, of course, does it sound like the record? And we'll get into that in a minute, like things sounding in the context of a mix versus how they sound when you play them straight up. Right. Uh, but for this is one of those kind of patches I could just sit here and play it 
and and I was having fun with it. You know, like it just sounded right. And there's not much to it. And I really uh, kind of a sticker because sometimes when you see people's uh, signal chains in these things, they're like they've added in a compressor, they've added in EQs, they've added in all these things. I kind of work from the back end. Like, okay, I, I really want to just try to get the sound right from my amp and from my speaker and the reverb. And then if I have to do some EQ, which in the studio there always is going to be some EQ. That's one thing that people think of. any, like a lot of guitar recordings that the low ends scooped off. You don't notice notice it because it sits in a mix better. Yeah. So um, that's one of the magic of Marshalls. They're not real low end heavy. So when you play them in a context of a band, they they sit where they're supposed to. Yeah. But so I've tried I tried to keep a lot of these as very simple, like as guitar pedal amp kind of thing. You know. Yeah. Yeah, the, the patches themselves, you know, we didn't use up all the blocks just because they're there. Right, we, exactly. we really and, and actually, <laughs> to tell the truth, that would be more like me. I'd be going, oh, well, you know, he might have he might have stepped on the drum. He might have used that channel. Jeff's like, yeah, no, delete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pair this back to what's actually on the record. Yeah. And actually on this one, there's actually two patches for this. One is the rhythm sound and one's the solo sound. Um, yeah. We built a separate one. And it's tweaked. You know, yeah, it's a good, be... The other thing we should say, you know, Jeff's going to change guitars, uh, it, and um, we say in the release notes which guitar we were using to model. So Jeff, I don't own a Les Paul. Guitar. I was using my PRS DGT, and there were times when Jeff would be like, "Yeah, BGT is a little buzzier, a little tele more telly like than the Les Paul." I Until think David the EQ setting is better, and so we'd always go back to to Jeff's because he's he's got all the right ones. We actually don't have any of the tunes on the list. That are SG. Well, I can I can play yeah, a bit, but yeah. but like the all your love rhythm sort of thing. It's you know, yeah. and so it's it's very similar amp sound. Just kind of rolled the gain back. Yeah, and yeah. I don't. One thing that I want to point out in a lot of these patches because uh, I played them, I designed them the way I actually play guitar. So one thing that's really important is. Um, for the most of these, when you might plug in with your pickup and go, well, that's a little gainy, I would roll back my volume knob a bit. So I tried to make them as ampy as possible. Right. You know, yeah. um, my ears heard the All Your Love Rhythm guitar part is probably him. He probably just turned the amp down a little bit to make it clean up a bit. Yeah. Because it sounds still very bright. These are just, I'm just guessing. I don't know. But um, so for the lead part, I just, the, the, the All Your Love solo patch I, we just turned up the gain on the amp. Basically, it didn't change anything. Like, he probably wouldn't and turned up the gain. So, but sometimes if you're messing around with the patches, um, for me, like, if I go back to the lead patch, uh, I roll back. You know, just by a little bit. So if I'm going to play that on a gig... Right then. Right. So it's all coming from, that's the lead patch, but you can experiment with rolling back your volume. Right. And, and, and actually we're going to hear from people that say um, it's not hot enough or it's too hot with the guitar in their lap. And the answer to those questions is in the release notes as a reminder is that's your, right under your pinky folks. It's that, it's that volume knob and small changes can make a big difference, even in a model, you know, it's, it's certainly with an amp, but especially even in a model you're going to hear big changes in the way it's hitting. And, and you, these are pretty low output, but we mentioned that these are like standard low output PAF. These are uh, throwback SLE 101. So it's like seven point something like they're pretty low output pickups, you know? Um, so if you have a guitar that's got a lot higher output pickup, you, you're going to have to dial things to taste. It's impossible to dial it in for everybody's playing exactly. So for me, it's really just like it's a little gainy. Well, just dial the game back in here and you're good or roll down your volume. Either one. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. That's uh, so that's the all your love. We'll, we'll see. We'll see if we've set off the copyright. We won't know till the end. Um, I don't think so. I we'll see if the fun overrode the. <laughs> I don't think I played too much. It's like they can't get me on playing. Try. Well, maybe they can. No. Yeah. Let's do um. Let's do badge next. Well, actually, no. You know what? Get grab your grab your strat. Let's do Layla since you already segued us on that. So this is a this is a great example. So uh, you know we're hey folks, it's five watt world. So the story is that there was a 57 champ in the studio for the Derek and the Domino session. Tom Dowd, who was a producer engineer on the date, actually had said that it wasn't a champ, 
that despite the sig the signature model 57 that Clapton did with Fender, et cetera, that what was there was a, was a blackface uh, champ. Mm -hmm. That was what was in the studio. And, um, and then he was, because they liked the sound so much, so the story goes that they set the amp on top of the piano with the lid closed, I put it up on the piano, mic'd it, and then threw a packing blanket over it. So while they were, and then they could just hear what was in the room, you know, probably about as loud as I'm speaking now. Um, but as we all know, a five watt amps still pretty, can be still really loud. Um, sure. So they liked the tone that they were getting off the blackface one so much. They literally sent Tom out to go buy one. And he came home with a, you know, a silver face, which is what they were then. So there's, there's this mix of that. So I actually did sort of an elaborate patch where um, we were using the, the 57 Tweed champ. And then I was dialing in a little Princeton to sort of get some more of the scoop and stuff. And then in the end, Jeff was working on one separately. And, um, and Jeff, you know, we're on the phone all the time. He's like, you know, if you listen to the original thing and really concentrate on the guitar, the guitar tone is awful. It's, it's just crap. <laughs> like in isolation, it is the perfect example of an isolated guitar track that in isolation, without the bass player, without the second guitar, all that stuff, it just sounds terrible and in a wonderful way. Yeah. And it, it, it's not, it's something I didn't really think about until I started doing this. I'm like, oh yeah, that is terrible. So, uh, you know, it's hard to... It's very direct almost, like there's a buzziness in the top. Yeah, Have you listened yeah, to the track? It's almost like a direct to the board. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the no, lack no. of body. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play that. We, we it's amazing how much they jump on these, but that's right. We knew this would be fun. We're, we're and, and also playing with the when AI. they multi oh sorry man. No, no. Sorry. Then when they multi-track it, it gets much thicker sounding and fuller. So when you listen to this track and you're like, the guitar, you're like, oh, it sounds a little buzzy and thin. But if you listen to it in, like in headphones like we did, I tried. And then you, if you go on YouTube, you can hear a lot of these solo tracks. And you're like, wow. So if you listen, there's a flubbiness <laughs> to those notes that any of those tweed amp, those champ, tweeds always get, especially the lower gain, where they're like the cheap tweed champs, right. get this sort of flubby thing. Um, Absolutely. And so even though it's an eight inch speaker you're, you're yeah. asking the speaker and that's the reason that other amps flow out too is often you're asking the amp or the speaker to do something it was never designed to handle right right so it's coming apart falling apart as they say yeah and and so it creates a certain thing and i think one thing that comes to mind even though it's clapton if you listen to black dog by zeppelin and i've heard those individual tracks soloed there's like a direct guitar distortion track in that and hmm. Zeppelin's really, it's very really obvious if you start listening because the mixes are always so good from Page, but he mixes these sounds that on their own would be like, oof, I'm never, why would you ever use that? But what it did is it felt, it filled a, a frequency that was not in the original recording or, you know, put it in there. Or it was not in the other guitars. So if you listen to Black Dog, it sounds like there's a direct guitar part going on, which there is. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we got a top chat in here from the 5150 show. Um, uh, from New Zealand, thanks. Uh, and it says, um, thanks Keith and Jeff, your vids on, I assume this is for you, your vids on British Electric Blue stuff are always fascinating. Well, maybe that is both of us, but yeah, certainly Jeff, nice, yeah. Jeff has <laughs> Jeff has multiple courses and has a recently, actually recently ran a sale on um, uh, his British Blues here. What's your, what do you call it? Uh, it's uh, Blues Rock Masters, the British edition. There you and go. it's Clapton Page, Beck and- Gilmore. Uh, Gilmore, yeah, and I can get that link if you guys. It's I'll get you the link right now. It's forty off if with this particular link if you want. Nice. BB's probably still got it from yesterday. Yeah, BB, BB modded for yesterday. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we but, can throw um, that in just for these kids, and then we'll yeah. it'll be in the it'll be in the stream. But uh, that's not what we're we're talking about today. <laughs> no, we're talking well, about it's, but, it's not. But but that's what uh, that's what fifty one fifty is talking about, and yeah. And the reality is those things certainly go hand in hand. I mean, this is sure. this I've said I, I've lost track of the number of videos where I'm making a video about Paige or somebody, and I'm like, of course, this sent me back to Jeff's original True Fire course on this and right. uh, and the new course and stuff. So, um, and that's that's always it's just such good stuff. So, uh, let's see. I got, I'm I'm looking at the stream in case we have somebody jumping in with a, a tune request, uh, but that's Layla. And we're, we're like well, beautifully just, on just, schedule. 
little little guitar nerdery like you know so it's it's more gonna be it's hard to tell sometimes it's a bridge pickup often clapton played on the middle pickup too you know um i think his later guitars you were saying don't have a five-way they have a three-way switch yeah yeah, yeah and it's weird because I, I and to me i in cocaine and lay down sally i am hearing the two and the four i could be wrong sometimes it's rough it's sometimes kind of hard if it's not mark knopfler sometimes you're like what what's going on is that the right. two and the four like if it's not a brighter cleaner tone but um yeah like because you actually don't hear the quack i've been playing this prs modern eagle where i'm trying to dial in stratty kind of tones and i'm messing with the cq and i just keep adding trouble like you said stop looking at what the number is and yeah. just keep dialing in eq until you get that hollowness in the front pickup split mm -hmm. and things and like you said you, you don't look at what the numbers are and you yeah. start realizing how much trouble there is in those original signals you know yeah yeah it's with those two and then also some of these set, like so i go to the neck like <laughs> You're like great on the higher strings, but on those lower those lower notes, that's what a tweed, that's what a champ does. You know, right. when you crank it up, it does blow. And then the, the low end is really rolled off. So, but if you do it in the bridge, see it holds right. together much better. So yeah. those are things that when you start playing these tones, you're like, oh, you got to play to the, the amp tone as well. So right. um, those well, are really and at, important. And at the same time, you know, um, if people go back to what video was it where I was talking, oh, I think it was the deluxe video. I was talking about dialing in a tweed deluxe, or maybe it was the champ video where Dave Cobb, the producer Dave Cobb says that he never turns up his tweeds above three or four because what he's trying is just to get an edge of breakup. And of course, you know, they were back to roll back your volume and stuff. They're incredibly, and this patch sounds really good, you know, sort of in the middle of the neck on the upper strings. It's a wonderfully sweet and harmonically rich tone yeah. if you're not over, if you're not asking it to do too much. Right, if you're not asking to do what you would do on that amp. On that track. <laughs> on that, or on that track, or if I had that amp and you got like, oh, what a great bridge tone I've got out of this, then I wouldn't go to the neck because it's not necessarily going to fly. Right, right. It's just not going to Just a little, little note when you're playing, you're going like, wow, how come this sounds so great? And then if I go to the neck, it, that's not how we dialed it in. You know? right. And that's not how they dialed it in. Yeah. Right. So um, just so folks have a sense of it, this was modeled on the guitar that's in Jeff's lap right now, which is 64 Fender Stratocaster with original vintage pickups. Yeah, it's all original, yeah. With Except all original, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually, I even have it in the release notes that um, you want to be rolling back the volume to find out where, you're, where you want to yeah. sit. So, yeah, totally. And you know, the thing that most people do is dial in too much gain. Almost always, people dial in more gain than when I was on the original recording because it feels like there's more energy and that usually... Jeff said something recently that I hear in my head all the time now. Um, you were on a, a live stream in the last month and you said that if if you're playing a solo blues and people would say to you, well, you know, I get bored doing this. I get bored playing a playing a blues over and over. And your response was, if you're bored playing the blues, you're not playing it right. Like you're not <laughs> yeah. putting all of the parts in that they did. Yeah. So there's a lot more to having it. So I would say that's true. So since Jeff's got the Strat in his lap, Let's talk about Forever Man. And I'm going to let Jeff talk about this because it re this really was a breakthrough that Jeff had um, that has to do with um, mid-range, yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, the and investigating this, and there's the, when you look at the video that we did on these on Clapton's guitars, my friends over at Watchtower had a, one of those um, gold leaf modern Clapton guitars. You know, it was a great sounding guitar. Significantly different than this. Like, it was amazingly different because it's got those... Um, it wasn't the lace sensors, it's the later ones, the Defender Noiseless. So the guitar almost sounds a lot higher fi than this stuff. And right. so that's something to think about when you're playing those guitars and Clapton's a little bit more modern tones, that there, there's a little bit more of a, a, a attack on the higher end. Also, what he did was uh, he put in a mid boost at 500, right? 500 megahertz yep. or, yeah. Yep. And yep. so what I did to emulate that, because that's a very, very specific sound that he's getting so i just put an eq pedal in the front with the 500 megahertz burst uh, boost there yep. so if you think about the solo and that like oh he and the middle pickup right so it in the context of the if you go to that neck you get that he gets it a little bit on the lower end. It's not super tight. If you listen to his later tone, it's not a super, it's not like a, a Steve Ray neck pickup where it's this tight, hollow. It's hollow but tight. Clapton's mm -hmm. got a lot of that mids that 
pushes it into almost borderline fuzz, right? Because also the mid, it's a mid boost, so he's pushing the front end of the amp more too. Right. Um, so in the context, it's actually, but this tone. So what I did was, well, he's using Soldanos back at that point in time right. and V30s. I'm pretty yep. sure. Yeah, that's, okay. that's what they shipped in the Soldano cabs at the time we went and did the research. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so and there's a touch of chorus because that was back in the day when he had a whole big Soldano uh, and a Bradshaw rig right. set up right. and the whole thing like we all that's did. It. It's the, the Trinity well, chorus. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, you can hear it. It's not overwhelming. <laughs> It's just enough to kind of give it that space, and it's it's a stereo thing that you're going to hear when you're spreading the cross. And then, a little bit of delay. Hear it? Yeah. And the delay. You, you used a you were this used a ducking delay. Yeah. For and the, so to really keep it out of the way. Right. So what I like about the ducking delay, which was a big thing at that period of time as well, and I use them sometimes, is uh, when I stop playing, the delay kind of comes up, fills in some of that space in a in a. Uh, ambient way you, it, you said you don't hear bop, bop, bop. like it's just this sort of thing and when i'm playing it's not bouncing around you don't hear it that loud and then it kind of comes back up when you're given the space and that's really kind of a cool thing that came around as far as i know in the 80s in this period so we just um i also set the foot switch uh to turn off the eq for the boost right so this patch can be used we have the rhythm guitar patch which is very similar just a lot cleaner and a little compression because they had that 80s kind of compressed guitar sound going on um, which is really pretty and I also put the boost on that one as well so you can kind of experiment that the foot switch would be your your boost for your lead gain so if I turn it off I'm, not, I don't want to make sure I'm just going to do it from the desktop because uh just make sure I'm... all right so here's the boost off right <laughs> sounds good right you know yeah So it's not like a ton more gain. It actually just pushes your mids more and you cut through the mix quite a bit too. Okay. So BB is saying, uh, could you up your volume? I'm not sure if he means your microphone volume or your guitar volume. Which one? Uh, I don't know. Let's see what he tells us. He can hear us. Uh, in the meantime, Ed Rabe um, from California, a uh, longtime friend of five watt says uh, he's got a top chat. He says he's wondering why he wasn't notified of the live feed. Ed, he says he'll give us five bucks, but only if I can give him a good reason. Um, I, Ed, that probably was me. I built this l pretty late yesterday um, because I've been working on the next script already. And I, you know, it's one of those things where you have it done and I should have done it Tuesday so that you guys would have a much more time um, uh, to see it. Or, or as BB is saying, it could well be a YouTube thing. Um, notifications to subscribers are very spotty. Yeah. And I will tell you that one of the reasons um, I'm, I'm going to be doing more, sh a little bit shorter content sometimes is that just if, if you haven't been watching my channel recently, then it doesn't think that you won't necessarily want to see what I'm putting out right away. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of recognize the two week cycle. So if you're catching a live stream one week and then the actual video release. So th that's part of the, the sort of future of shorts and things like that. Um, so um, it, it's a tough, it's a tough balancing act, but it could well be, as BB says, a YouTube uh, issue as much as uh, putting it out late. Uh, so uh, somebody wanted to know, is Clapton still using Blackie when the Behind the Sun album was recorded? Okay, somebody's gonna have to tell me what year that was. Because he used Blackie until 1985. Because he got, uh, if you go back and watch the video, Clapton got um, some Fullerton reissue guitars in 83. And he liked them. <clears throat> he got an 80, um, an, uh, a 57 reissue in that batch. And he got a Fender Elite guitar. And he liked features of both. And it was around that time that he... Um, he had uh, Robert Giffen build him a couple of guitars, but at the same time, he had just started talking to Fender about his signature model. And by, if I got, am I off a whole decade? It was, oh, I need Bill Sanderson. So you guys can see that I'm actually a researcher here. <laughs> uh, so it was probably 95. Probably 95. We talk about 90, the later 95. one. 95. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 95. Not 85. The, yeah. the lace sensors. Right. 
right? Yeah, so it was 95. But but he got guitars in the 80s that he liked. And he played Blackie until he got those uh, those Giffen guitars. And then he played the Giffen guitar for a couple of years until the, you know, until the red, the first prototype guitars were done. And those were built, master built guitars. He got three guitars, two pewter and one red. Um, So some of this stuff I remember, guys. So uh, he's saying, uh, Murray Williams says that your mic volume that oh. feels a little light. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Is there you go. Is that it's probably just your, you're just probably just how close you're up on that dynamic. I know. I'm just, yeah, I got to get it. Yep. Uh, RMPC is reminding us. And, you know, when we're talking about, we're going to talk about uh, some things. And somebody else also asked a question about uh, running on faith from uh, Blind Faith. They were, he was using um, Fender amps in that period of time already. And especially you see pictures on the Blind Faith Studio ones where there's twins and deluxes and stuff in the background. There was fenders all through that. And then, of course, by the time he's on tour with Bonnie and um, Delaney. Thank you, Bonnie and Delaney. Um, then there's the whole, it's all the whole back line is fenders uh, when he has actually moved to playing Brownie all the time. So uh, the, 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 the period that gives me the sads. <laughs> what does it give I- you? the sads <laughs> no, no, I, I love like you know that <laughs> stuff too it's just i'm just such a cream fan you know what i mean well and speaking of that somebody asked if strange brew is in the packet and it's not and and we I talked believe, about yeah. the fact that um it's similar to other things that are in the packet so so what do we have in the packet that's like sg cream driven oh uh, that would be sunshine and we have like a wheels of fire alive Say again. We have a Wheels of Fire live. Well, a Crossroads. Sorry. Oh, Crossroads, right? And then Sunshine or Your Love. Right? Yeah, we got Crossroads uh, WF, like from Wheels of Fire, obviously. So for me, that's Spoonful uh, sitting on top of the world. all those live thing. Not well, not sitting on top of the world. The reason why we didn't do Strange Brew in particular is that is one of my least favorite guitar tones from Eric Clapton of the Cream era. If you ah. listen to the, I like the rhythm guitar part. The lead guitar part sounds no. The, it almost sounds direct. Hmm. It, I, I just, that's the one I, in that record, I mean, that record contains some of my favorite guitar tones of all time. And then there's that song. I'm like, oh, what happened there? Because, I mean, you got, you know, Sunshine Your Love on that. And you're like, whoa, right. listen to that guitar tone. Killer guitar know? tone, right. Or the or Fresh Cream, you've got Spoonful or Sleepy yeah. Time Time, all these amazing guitar tones. And then Strange where you're like, oh, that's, that was an interesting choice. So for my ear, that's yeah. not my... You, know, you, you want to grab your SG and give them a taste of the sunshine preset? Since since we had somebody specifically asking you for strange brew, I think we've got, well, we're at 440 already. I think we got time. We can run over. We're among friends here. Yeah. It's duly said that uh, that was 85. Boy, that's what, I don't, I don't know. Is it Keith? I See, but the lay sensors doesn't make sense for that. Bill Sanderson's got. Um, i uh, got another uh, top chat somebody asking for a history of bigsby uh, particularly about the bridge history so okay yeah all right so we're gonna do the sunshine we're gonna get a little taste of the sunshine pasture um well the thing the lead solo but you know i've got the uh the neck pickup <laughs> guitar that guitar does that sound it does yeah yeah oh, and it's wow. really been, I can see why you got why you grabbed that when you came across it and, and what's yeah it's a good one and what's fun about them as i got into these things like when i pick up the 335 you're like oh yeah that is a 330 i had, a, I had an argument no it wasn't <laughs> an argument yeah well it was a, a liquor infused conversation argument over what guitar clapton played on crossroads uh you mean on Wheels of Fire on the live section? No, it wasn't Crossroads. It was on what what, what live tune was it? We were both, it was me and Robin Ford having too many martinis. He's like, "No, man, 
that's oh no no what no it was it was sleepy time time he's like no that's a 335 i'm like no that's a les paul so or i'm like or could be the sg he's like that's not an sg it's a three it was a kind of funny yeah. conversation and right, then, right. um but i'm like crossroads that's a les paul that's a 335 you know yeah. like so it was that kind of funny i played a 335 for for decades i know what a 335 sounds like i'm like oh okay. it doesn't make you right <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, now we're back to the two stories yeah. um, because um, Clapton in multiple locations says that he had the 335 in the studio and recorded badge with it. Yeah. That that was badge and that that's what it was. Right. So am I right that Stephen Macrolane might be a relative of yours? He might be my 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 brother who I adore. Yeah. You're, <laughs> yes. you're uh, the, the guy who when you when you did the Beano uh, thing, it was his Princeton, right? His Princeton, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, your lovely brother Stephen just top chatted us. Hey, what's up, Steve? Yeah, and he oh, says wow. there is nothing I can add to this. All great. Oh, thanks, buddy. So I'm sure there's. I'm sure he could tell us Jeff stories that we would all enjoy. Steve, I'll have you on next week. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one I sent the uh, the map of uh, Scotland to in the in the in the style of the Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But he got it. He got it. Yeah, he got it yesterday. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Uh, okay, um, so yeah, so. Uh, also, just you know, I went to the neck pickup. Um, mm. What I love about that one, and I'm here's my my ears after we're doing this. Everybody's like, always oh, says the woman tone. He rolls back the tone now. But if you listen to that recording of Sunshine, there's still a lot of high end going on. So I feel like he's just pushing the amp on the neck pickup. Because if you roll back and get that woman tone, just by dialing back the tone. Was, but if you get kind of keep it up. You get some of the, the, the highs that yeah he's that right at the is. edge he's right at the edge because there's still like you're saying there's more definition yeah in exactly. the tone than there would be if it like people always dime off their tone and i was like no no, no that's just mud that's just not how that sounds yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah cool cool uh, all right uh let's see where were we we were we were we did forever man yep. and what else was on the list we had we get oh, some, oh, it's yeah, time sure. for badge oh yeah, yeah. yeah sure You know, uh, BB always... Ninja is reminding us that Behind the Sun was recorded in 1984 and released in 1985. Wow. So it, it was 85 that he put away uh, Blackie. The black guitar. In the video. Okay. Um, so what? I, what there's a great track on YouTube. If you search out badge no vocals or isolated guitar there's no guitar solo either it's just the break the break and the the rhythm guitar part so first of all as a performance note the rhythm guitar part is so well played like it's so groovy and cool i wish i could play all i mean to say like that groovy and cool that part is but if you listen to it and of course there's tremolo on it right right but you can, you can only hear it when it first steps out at the end of the verse right yeah right. when you get the yeah, that chord right there. Yeah. yeah, but if you listen to the that solo track that's on YouTube, you hear it on the rhythm guitar part. You totally this is also do. the first chord of a love song by The Cure. There you go. There you go. That's a bonus, so that's bonus, bonus lesson today. Yeah, yeah sure. I suddenly like I'm playing too much like oh, it. Oh wait, wait, that was too much. So actually, we we all I panicked. We had so much fun with Badge. Burma. There actually are four patches for Badge. Okay. There's a combination patch, yeah. which makes some compromises that we weren't comfortable having without giving everybody a Badge solo. Because as as Jeff says on the original, there's there's no guitar solo on that track that you can hear. There's no space for guitar solo. Yeah. And then um, there's a Leslie patch specifically. Yes. I was just laughing because I realized I, I did a Monty Python reference that just flew right by you. What well, was it? Oh, sorry. I, I said Burma. I panicked. You know, <laughs> why'd you say Burma? I don't know I that one. Penguin on, t on a television set? Oh, I, I, I don't know that. <laughs> I said Burma. All right. So there's this. And then well, I'm sure, I'm sure we've had people in the chat that are all over there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Jeff's going to walk us through the different versions of the map. Okay, so here's uh, the rhythm guitar version. Here and you know. Over. Right? So then we get that. So it's pretty subtle, right? And I'm going to neck pickup for that. Could be the bridge. Could be, it's hard to hear it, like, but. 
middle. Right? And then we go to the, uh, of course, the break. The, uh, the Leslie patch. Right. Um, which and is then, just... and John, John, um, um, jumps in at the, at the exact right time and says, George Harrison played the rhythm on badge. That's and it's thought. highly debated. Yeah. That whether he wrote the part or he was there and he played the part or what, of course they wrote the song together, but, but that rhythm guitar part is completely underrated as a, as a guitar teacher and fan. You sometimes be like, oh, I want to learn badge. You start listening. You're like, oh man, I actually didn't realize how. Do you think, do you think uh, it was, it was Harrison or Clapton playing the rhythm part? Put you on the spot. I, I've never heard George Harrison play that way. Okay. And you but, have Clapton play that way. Well, he's the more, even like from that, that the, the, the documentary that was on Apple, like, you know, the, I'm not the guitar, like he's the guitar. I don't play guitar like that. That kind of thing with George Harrison's like, I don't play guitar like that. That's why we, that's why I, I can't, brought him that's in. why we got Eric Clapton there. Yeah. So right. I don't know, but, um, I'd love to think that it was George Harrison because it's so groovy and it's so well played. And he's got those fills, like those Hendrixy kind of fills, Motown things. I just had never heard Harrison play anything like that. I think Harrison's a great guitar player. I mean, certainly you always know, okay, generally speaking, I always know when it's George Harrison playing guitar, you know, but that's not one of those places. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and people are filling the chat. With me, you know, I love it. Um, and Davey devolution, finding us that bridge, you know, mm -hmm. on a piece of paper became badge that it oh, was yeah, that's right. pronounced yeah, yeah. And, and that became the name of the tune. And then later Clapton added that section, you know, where's my badge where he played the tune live. He added yeah. the whole back section. That's like, Oh, okay. Well now make it sound like it was intentional. Yeah. 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 Right. So that's the Leslie. That was one of those really, it, it's, it's close. That's a very tough one to grab like 100%. So, you know, when sometimes these things, it, what we have to always remember, not saying these don't sound like it, I think if I use this on a gig, but you know, you're in this like whatever, Abbey Road studio, let's just throw that out there, that it's Abbey Road tape machine, like, you know, tube, comp everything is the top yeah. of the line, tape, everything, you know. Right. Like and, just... and tons of transformers between you yeah. and the tape, tons yeah, exactly. of transformers yeah. warming everything up. Right. right. So when people are like, well, it doesn't sound exactly like the records, like, well, yeah. Right. You know, because uh, of a million things. And, you know, if you grew up also like listening to it on vinyl, like there's all these things that make us think about these things. But um, I thought I thought this sounds pretty great. Like I'd be totally happy. And it's all in like three foot switches, you know. Now the solo. Um... So that solo is actually pretty dry. Um, and it's one, of, once again, I would always felt like that that would have been a bit more of a classic crossroads kind of guitar tone. And when I listened to it, I'm like, no, it's actually, it's much thinner, like not in a, a negative sense. It's just not that big full on, like for me, the, the, the consummate guitar tone of that era, there's two tunes um, that were, I think you can only get with that amount of volume and it would be like uh, sleepy time time and, and and any of the wheels of fire stuff. So that's why I grabbed that. So my point is I'm like, Oh, it's going to try the wheels of fire and bring it over here. And I'm like, no, it's not really, it's not really getting it the same way. No. So, right. Yeah. Um, now, interestingly enough. So what I ended up doing because I wanted to put it in one patch I found and I just kept the amp the same and I put on basically which which is an OCD like the uh, right. the full tone pedal and here the cult they have the compulsive drive and I was like you know let me just try a pedal so this is one of those situations like well I don't need to dial in that this sounds actually closer to me than sometimes the amps do now one little interesting thing is when you're using amps for your uh, overdrive sometimes for an amp sound overdrives or Overdrive pedals, the reason why people like them a lot is sometimes they hold together better than amps sometimes do. Right. So for me, this held together really nicely. I just turned it on. I'm like, well, oh, it's kind of there. And I just futzed with the, and you agreed. You played it. You're like, eh, actually, that yeah. sounds, sounds Yeah, and, and actually, uh, I'd be the one to admit that that's not a pedal I've ever owned. 
and mm-hmm. it's not one that I tend to love. And you don't really see them in live rigs, but this model, it does just what you said. It, it yeah. tightens it up and it's a and it's a great Marshall sort of sweetener. It takes it another step towards that Marshall tone of being tighter. And like mm-hmm. you said, that playing it, playing it at a volume, which is really probably what the OCD was originally designed to do. Yeah. Any yeah, pedal that usually is, was yeah. trying to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, so um, we're coming up on the hour, but if folks, I'm sure you probably snuck some requested tunes that are in the list. I can tell you what's in the list, and we can come, we can double back. We got badge. You could talk about Crossroads. The Crossroads was so much fun for me because I, you know, we we divvied these up first drafts, and the Crossroads run came, and it's so incredibly simple and wonderful. Um, and well, everybody else want to see. I keep saying I like we went back and forth. I just remember what I did. Keith would send me something, and I'd be like, "Oh yeah, oh that's pretty close and cool." And then I would tweak and vice versa. So, I mean, the stuff that you, that I mean, you were I didn't sound like we're complimenting each other because we are, but it was super right. helpful because you're like, "Oh, check out this reverb." I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's much better than the one I was using." Like, right. or, you know, the delays or knowing the or, or we did actually end up using two cabinets um, on the crossroads. We used um, a single amp, but we used two cabinets. We did use the Park Seventy Five for that in the end, but we used a black back cab with a 57 on it and a green back cab with a 421. Um, yeah. and, and that was, you know, we're all trying to, and we were listening to wheels of fire, obviously, but we were trying to capture the amount of girth that the original track has. And it's just, it's just huge. Um, yeah. So I kind of, so if I do like, I'm hearing spoon, like, Designed it to just use your volume. Now, in this patch, I did throw in an overdrive pedal for just a hair more if you're playing like a strat or something that's a little lower yep. output. Or just sometimes at home, you're like you said, you just want a little more, you want a little easier to play. Yep. And we use the um, the air apparent, which is basically a king, um, uh, a ton- uh, king of tone. Yeah. Yep. So, and mostly though, I think we mostly use it as a boost. I don't think we ever used the distortion setting on the air apparent because we use it on a few patches. And again, like the OCD, it was uh, it was tightening it up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it you, and and it also gives you a foot switchable, turn it on, and it, you just need a couple of switches on the stomp. But and again, I'll remind everybody if you didn't know this, you can upload those to the Helix as well. Uh, not to get too much about the the uh, the ad campaign here. <laughs> um, so. Uh, it's so like uh, Eric Eric Johnson says um, in the video, did you call the lace gold lace gold pickups Alnico three? And is that correct? So no, I, I didn't. I actually don't know the construction specifically of lace sensor pickups. And the gold was the most vintage version. If everybody remembers, if people are like me, old enough to remember the the gold, the red, the blue. The red was the really hot one. Uh, the blue was sort of in the middle, right? And the gold was the most vintage one. And and it had when the guitars were released. Um, they had um, three gold lace centers, sensors. There's actually all this talk that the original prototypes were built with Alnico three pickups, but all the photographs that I could come across, either there were later versions of the prototype or there is debate. And this, um, this site, Jeffrey's Guitars, who actually is a guy who's in the film and movie business, um, film and TV t- uh, producer who has this amazing page um, it's linked in the description of the original video on all the generations. And he has had has, has a, an online shop where he's moved a lot of uh, prototypes through there and stuff, but a whole bunch of all the different generations of the signatures, great stuff. But even the photos he had, they're all flat topped pickups. They all look like a lace sensor. They don't have pull pieces. They don't look like an Alnico. So it could be that they were really, really earlier versions, but those never were released in production guitars. So that's that's what I could gather uh, from that. And actually, I had a really nice comment from him. He was delighted that uh, Bill Sanderson put me onto um, his website, and uh, and he reported to me that uh, he had sold Bill guitars over the years, which oh. didn't surprise me at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> knowing my friend Bill. So um, one uh, thing to, to to remind everybody that we can never really get is 
Well, you can, but a lot of these things we listen to Wheels of Fire and we get as close as we can. But if you really turned it up super loud and played it, that's the always the missing element of all of these things. We're like, I want to get that crossroads sound, or I want it to sound like you know. How did Hendrix do the band, like you know the Star Spangled Banner? It's like, well, if you've ever had the opportunity to play a Marshall, the Gibson through a Marshall like super lead through two four twelves at volume, you're like, oh. <laughs> like a lot of the things that you hear in records make a lot more sense right because you hit the note and you get that feedback and everything's interacting things are it's like riding the wild beast though you know what i mean yeah. with the, especially right. with a semi hollow you got to keep you got to be on it you have to learn how to do it but some of the things you hear um and when you're playing these if you do get a chance to turn them up as i did they'll start to actually feel better too, because you just start right. to get the interaction between the amp and the speakers yeah. and yeah. yeah. And people that have been following the channel for a while have heard me talk about it before. I went through a period of time where I was building amplifiers and uh, I started out thinking I should build amps that I wasn't going to spend the money on. And, and frankly, I probably didn't have the money at the time. And I wanted a really, really clean JCM 800 because it was an amp that, you know, I'd never owned. And, and I was kind of coming out of my jazz years and wanted a, a real rock amp. So I actually bought Mercury Magnetic uh, transformers. You guys will all be surprised to learn that I was obsessive about collecting new old stock trans uh, resistors and uh, capacitors. And I built this amplifier. <clears throat> and, it was, and I'll tell you, it was the only one that ever, the first time I turned it on, ran. Every other time it was like smoke and stuff and damn, Lori had to fix it. But um, so I had this amp and, and, and people don't talk about it, but absolutely glorious cleans. Oh my God. In the low input, on the on the low low input channel on the AC hundred is amazing. The punchline of the story is and people from Burlington, some people from Burlington, Vermont, where I used to live, know Kevin Boyer, who worked at Advanced Music, and I took lessons with Kevin for a while. Kevin's like, you you need to bring that down to the store after hours. So I packed up my JCM eight hundred and I brought it down with my two by twelve greenback. I had a greenback and a creamback cab, and I brought it down, and we closed up the store. Kevin turned it up. And it was a completely different beast. It was yeah. just, and, and it was in a, like a big pole barn, insulated pole barn, kind of a store. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and Kevin was playing, he's a great rock guitar player and he's playing. And then he, and, he, and, it, and it's it like, it's a big chord and that's the end. And I'm like, oh my God, that's, that's perfection. I got to sell it because I will never use that. Right. You know, it's, well, <laughs> and it was a point to point JCM 800. I built it like, an amp would have been built in the late sixties, but they never built them that way. No, it actually went to a guy who was a rock guitar player in a band in Miami. And uh, he wrote to me like 10 years later and he was still loving that amplifier because it was completely bulletproof. But anyway, sorry. If, if Thanks for indulging my story, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, well, I got the 72 hand wired Marshall. That's largely a paperweight. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Cause it's so loud and it's so big. It might as well so, be a green screen behind yeah, you. And it's so heavy. You know, yeah. and, you know, you're like, wow, I got to carry this thing to a gig. That's, you know, no, right. That, that you're like, you know, idling is. Yeah. 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 Well, a friend of mine, I bought, uh, uh, I bought one, a new one of these signs, David Casson did a, said, you know, did a different kind of sign as if it was a vanity plate. So I like the people that bought that and I bought this and then uh, Johnny Sloan, who's an old friend of five watts said to me, he's like, you know, you could have just copied that and printed it, you know, like really, really good. So we could do that with your amp backdrop. We could, we could photo, photograph really and make a, make a really good backdrop of it. Probably worked really well. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Um, well, we are slightly over time. Anybody, uh, if I ask for last questions, I know Perry's not on here because he had had a work conflict, uh, the damn day job. Um, but, and I think we got to the tunes that people asked us to get to. Uh, we're yeah. delighted. We got about 500 people still here, um, which is delightful. Uh, John, uh, <laughs> John is reminding me that it's after five show the Gibson. Okay. All right. So oh, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're Gibson. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, people have seen this before I I'm five foot nine and three quarters. And so this is my three thirty six ten. You're what? Six ten. You're saying, which is why that looks correct on you. Yeah, exactly. Right, and this isn't plugged in, but this is my 2013. Um, Do the and, wider screenshot. I can't you know. say what? Do your wider screenshot. Oh, I should. I, I should take you off. I'll, I'll just solo. For, just a here. second. Just a second. Just for a second. You could still talk though. All right. So Look at that guitar. Look at that. Look at that guitar. 
Very and nice. actually the back is even if possible even sicker than the front that's beautiful um, has a very 60s style neck the only criticism i would have of this guitar i absolutely love the uh, mini humbuckers on this guitar it's mm -hmm. it's positioned so that you're actually getting um you know where the humbucker would come to here so it's you can see that's a little further from the bridge than the humbucker takes up let's go back to jeff yep solo jeff you can see that the humbucker <laughs> do the spit <laughs> oh, take with a drink <laughs> uh <laughs> i take a little drink there uh, but you can see if you show your bridge um see you can see that comes closer you can put us both on screen here and i got the nylon saddles which would be period correct yeah right which and this is not i mean this is 2014 and this guitar is fully hollow so this is like an at-home guitar although you know i'm gonna say when i pick up the other guitar it's a casino substitute hey the beatles played their casinos live in in japan and germany yeah. in 65 so um so the guitar that i've long threatened to buy um there's a great friend of five, what David Whedon, and he bought one last year. And uh, they built this guitar for about six months in 2014, and they trickled them out over the next year. And it's that same guitar. Uh, this one's just a tad bit heavier. The neck is more rounded. It's more like a 50s neck. It has the Gibson P90s and um, dog-eared, obviously. Um, and uh, and they sound they sound great. I mean, I was talking to somebody or me immediately about other p90s that i might try i talked to is it john at throwback yeah yeah i talked that. to him for a long time when we were doing when i did the burst episode because p90s are actually um you know the original pafs were not designed to sound different they were just designed to sound quiet and so they were designed to sound like a 50 a late 50 a mid 50s paf so he builds a number of different p90 style pickups and one of them, he very specifically is like, this sounds as much like a PAF as a single coil pickup is going to sound. Okay. And uh, so I'd be very tempted. The other one after doing the L5 video that I'd be tempted to check out are the staple pickups, which are supposed to be a little more hi-fi. I will say that I'm a big Grant Green fan and I put um, half wound strings on here and I'll, I'll quote Jeff right in front of him. I, I texted Jeff and I, this is a text exchange he and I had. I'm like, so I've got these two guitars now. I used to have flat wounds on that to do the whole Beatles thing. Like, which of the two guitars should I put the flat ones on? Neither, as the text comes back. <laughs> and, and a few minutes later, I get another text. He goes, well, whichever guitar you don't want to play, put the flat ones on that. So <laughs> I sent that to David Hamburger. He laughed really hard. So the, the other thing about this guitar is obviously it's very 50s style. And when I got it in the mail, and it's 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 still the, the, um, the chrome's got to get buffed out, the bridge and stuff. And the chrome is actually worn off the A-string saddle. So this guitar, though it doesn't have dings and scratches, it's very clean. I mean, you can see with the lights, right? It's a very clean guitar. It's clean now. When I opened the case, you would think this guitar came from 1953. I spent two hours cleaning the guitar. I took all the hardware off and cleaned it. It's still not real clean under the bridge. And I'm going to take it to Amar at Ish Guitars and have him pull the hardware and buff it out and uh, bring it back to Chrome. But um, this is a very cool guitar. And you know, I, uh, you could, I'm, I'm just a huge P90 fan. And um, and this is one of those things, I got a good deal on it and I, I can always get my money back if I ever need to. And it sounds like a casino. So John, John, thanks for asking for that jail trim. And um, there, now, there, I've done my confession. I, I, I was raised Catholic, I feel better. So. Um, thank BV. For, yeah, and of course, I, I absolutely need to thank uh, Jeff. I put all the links uh, for all of these pieces in the description again, like at the last minute, right before Jeff and I got on here to start doing sound check today. Um, oh, David actually is here. Thanks, David. So great, that's great. Um, so uh, thanks to everybody, and I hope you enjoy it. And the folks that have bought the pack already, thanks for doing that. Yeah. And other folks, if you're into it, like I said, you can have the white room patch for free and give it a taste and see what you think. And um, as always, Jeff and I are just incredibly um, uh, touched by your support. Uh, yeah, thanks, so everyone. Thanks again. And I'll, I'll have uh, Jeff play us out by putting the, uh, the Clapton tones up again. And uh, well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the recording. I'm going to play the White Room thing again. Oh, I thought you wanted to play something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Okay. Take it easy, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.